Hello and welcome back again to Rage Gaming and more Dragon's Dogma 2. Today we're talking about more interesting, weird or useful things you might not have known about this game. We have a good amount of things from the comments as usual and a few from the community in general, but let's just get straight into it. Alright, so to kick us off for today's episode, I'm standing here at a camp. It's just out in the wilderness and we have four kind of suspicious characters standing here. There's a bunch of groups like this. They're essentially adventurers that are out in the world and I never really thought anything of it. If you stop and really look at them, they do look a little bit battle-worn. They all have kind of scars on them, on their face. And the one on the right there, you can see how he has a kind of scar under his eye that's familiar in the way that we have a scar on our chest. Apparently, what these are are imposters, fake arisen, and they're referenced in general by pawns and NPCs all around the world, and I just never noticed and never bumped into them. Or rather, I bumped into them loads of times and never realized that they're supposedly false arisen, they're pretending to be the arisen, you know, going on their adventure, trying to prove themselves, whatever. Obviously, there's lots of actual failed arisen or farmer arisen in this game and world, but there's also, yeah, lots of imposters. This was brought up on the Reddit a couple days ago. Dragon's Dogma Enjoyer, great name for posting on that reddit posted these four images of different imposter groups that don't have any interactions don't have any quests to do with them you can see with this pretty well-worn group what i mean by those scars in the comments of these discussions a lot of people thought they were just yeah bands of adventurers there's even a loading screen tip about this about imposters and we can even attack them and treat them like enemies our pawns will call out that these guys are imposters and once they're actually dealt with they should appear in our history and there you go at the bottom of enemies failed listings, we see my first listing of imposters defeated. That is their official name. These roaming bands of adventurers, those are arisen imposters. And yet nothing's ever really done with them. No quest, no reference, nothing. There are even listed NPCs like this one that you can interact with like any other. I'm wondering whether this is cut content or something they just chose not to do something with. Maybe something in a DLC or update will happen. It just feels weirdly unfinished. Next up, a little follow-up to what we talked about last time with the unmaking arrows. We talked about how, yeah, you can actually use the unmaking arrow on the dragon, the final fight of the game, and skip past everything, going straight to the kind of normal ending. It's ridiculously fast and effective. The unmaking arrow really does work as it says it should, but what's sad about that is obviously that the animation doesn't play. The unmaking arrow has a really unique animation. I showcased that when I used it on the Sphinx in my own gameplay. As you can see, this kind of burst of light comes out from the arrow shot these tendrils shoot out, kind of grasp the character or the, the target, and I guess the idea is they're kind of crushing them. Though the Sphinx death animation is unique, and that takes over the animation in this case. This was actually a pretty big topic of discussion in the comments, because when I take, say, a pawn here, like Faith, and we throw them into the water, the brine will take them, and we can see how it's got this kind of tendrily thing that's coming out and grasping them and grabbing them and dragging them down. That actually is shockingly familiar to the unmaking arrows death or kill animation. It's essentially the same thing, only instead of this dark red main enemy thing, it's golden and light, as if it's kind of the opposite of the brine. There was lots of discussions about it, but it was Breedez and Dick, who I hope I pronounced correctly, who said that what if it's like the opposite of the power of the maker or seneschal? It's like the opposite of the brine, that opposing nature. And it was the audiocrat who responded to that, talking about our crazy guy, the elder by Harv, who talks about the Talos well before it happens on other details. This guy actually outlines how the Talos is essentially the pawn of the brine. It exists to oppose and curb the excesses of the dragon. They're two opposing forces that are essentially fighting. So the unmaking arrow could actually be an extension of either the brine or, you know, the opposite. The watcher, the seneschal. They're using the same power but for different purposes or opposing goals. But in general, great spot guys about the animation of the unmaking arrow. Let me know if you have any interesting theories. Okay, so for our next thing, I'm standing here at the southwestern point of Vernworth. Behind me, as you can see, is the tips of a tower. What's interesting about this tower is it's really important relevance in regards to DD1, and maybe, hopefully, in an update or DLC or something future content-wise. This tower serves a very important purpose in the game as we know it today. In our normal world, it's just kind of a sunken structure where we're just barely seeing the tips of this tower. But obviously, as we swap to the unmoored world in the true end game, all that water is gone, and we see the full structure revealed. This becomes a very important 
important point where one of the red beacons are and ultimately one of the new unique dragon fights. This location is actually from DD1 and serves a really important purpose there too. This is considered the Blue Moon Tower. From the comments, Tabosa let us know that while Grand Soren is in the game, as we discussed, it's actually the Seafloor Shrine, the kind of OG city of DD1, so is the Blue Moon Tower. In the original game, north of the city, you would find the tower. It's a familiar circular structure with a giant arena in the center. The original Blue Moon Tower is actually a location where you would find, say, a nest of a griffin, and then an important character, Salomet, who's like an outlaw sorcerer. So I guess they ended up using this location as a neat new location for, you know, the unmod world and a boss, as well as just a neat reference in terms of where we are in the world. However, there's lots of discussion about whether this is actually the Blue Moon Tower. Maybe this structure to the south, the huge Colosseum Tower thing, where we have the final events of the story beginning. It would make sense as that's much bigger, that structure, but location-wise, this is just where the Blue Moon Tower should be. I found this image, which appears to be watermarked by PC Gamer, so I guess they made this, of our current Dragon Dogma 2 map overlaid with the Dragon's Dogma 1 map, where we can see this white, this is the original land structure. So what you have right here is actually Grand Surin, the original city. So if I open the map in game, you can see where this location used to be that area, and obviously the seafloor shrine is that location today. Looking at this map, we can see that the Blue Moon Tower is just north east of this location, which lines up perfectly with the tower we're talking about, the one that we're looking at here in game. Looking at this map and the overlay, we can see that the volcanic island is an entirely new region, and the big tower where the final events of the game actually happens is just a new location. Still, it is interesting to see this kind of side-by-side -side view, and to learn that another structure is actually back, just like Grand Sorin is, and the comparisons we made last time. Moving forward then, here's a trick you can do on any vocation. This post comes from Devil's Let's Plays, but it was also going around on Reddit. Originally posted by Upper Deku, this is pawn surfing. As you can see, the player is running up to a pawn and tackling them, and that's causing them to fall. Together, they're going to fall down to what would kill them on fall, and yet neither of them take any fall damage. So, obviously I jumped in to try this. Devil's Let's Plays talked about how you just have to run and jump up behind a pawn. If they're stood next to a cliff facing away from you, you'll jump and push them over the cliff with the momentum taking both of you over the side. This doesn't have any fall damage during this animation, and it doesn't matter how long you fall for, there won't be any damage. So yeah, pawn surfing. I found in my testing that it doesn't work quite so simply. You will need a pawn to be next to a cliff edge, but you need to do a specific grapple animation. The issue I had when I was trying to do this was I was running up and sprinting and trying to jump grapple them, and then I would kind of roll and tussle and we'd just roll at the edge not actually going off the side at all. You specifically need to have a pawn facing away from you, and you need to just be walking over to them, jump grapple. If you sprint, that's what causes the kind of spin tackle, and that does not work for going over the side. But yeah, just a normal moving jump grapple with them facing away from you towards, say, a cliff edge. This is how you can completely and utterly mitigate fall damage without any clever tricks such as magic archer reviving a pawn to catch you on the other end. Any vocation can do this, so it's pretty damn helpful. Next up, we have a follow-up to the Sedative Bolt. This is a weapon skill that you can use as a magic archer, or specifically if you're going to be playing a Warfarer. I showed this cool trick with the Medusa. You can go in there and just shoot one of these bolts fully charged at Medusa, and it will put her straight to sleep. An interesting aspect of the Medusa fight is how you can use slashing damage, of which many vocations use a weapon of that type, on her head, and if you deal enough damage quick in burst, you can decapitate her and reach the highest quality version of the head to instantly instantly kill enemies. I did a whole guide about that, but as it turns out, you can just use one sedative bolt, put her to sleep, and any slashing damage light attack will instantly decap her, which is really strong. This caused Brett Seberg to talk about this in the comments, how sedative bolt actually has some incredible effect on flying enemies. Take a drake or probably a griffin too. While it's flying, you can shoot out sedative bolt and it will immediately knock it out of the air every time. I found in my testing and trying this out that you don't even need to fully charge the bolt. It can be an unfinished, instant shot, and while it takes a moment to actually fly and collide, it will bring the drake straight out of the air, and I tried it against multiple drakes, and yet it kept working. I figure this will also work against other big flying enemies, which basically means just griffins, but it's quite the handy thing to be able to do, because say in some drake fights, the drake hangs in the air, it's casting spells, it's kind of annoying to deal damage to. Being able to bring it out of the air with one use, you don't even have to fully charge up, it's really nice. And just another showcase of how potent Warfarer can really be with the right combinations. 
But there you have it, another round of things you might not have known about. As always, if you have anything you'd like to add to the topics we've talked about today, or something that would fit into this series in general, please let us know in the comments, we might just include it. Until next time though, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice, to reiterate that it is nice, to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is, uh, goodbye.